Hi, good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. Ted, it is so wonderful to see you again. You too, in person. In, in person. person. It's been too long. Uh, and oh my God, what a year it's been for you. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a busy year, yes. It's been a busy year. It's only year. February, by the way. <laughs> it, it, it is, exactly. And, but, but even the last 12 months at Netflix, so much has happened. I mean, on January 19th, Reed Hastings, after two decades, stepped down and, you know, handed over the reins formally to you and co-CEO Greg Peters. Uh, 2022 was really difficult in terms of, at one point, you had a loss of subscribers, the stock prices plummet, and then in December, 7.5 million subscribers are added, which is actually beyond the analyst forecasts. Yeah. It's been a roller coaster ride. <laughs> Yeah, well, first on Reed, which is great, uh, four years ago he spoke at this conference, and this is post the transition. This is my first international visit to this conference. So, nice. thrilled to Welcome be in back. India, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. <laughs> um, and then on the other, uh, yeah, the first half of the year was pretty rough last year. Uh, got off to a slow start. The so, um, recovery from COVID and all these things made things quite uncertain. Remember, we shut down our operation in Russia where we had a million subscribers drop. So there was a whole lot of things we were navigating the first part of the year. And then the second half of the year um, really, you know, got, got moving. Uh, and I think it really speaks to the company that Reed built, uh, which was a uh, filled with people who are incredibly smart and resilient. And we really got singularly focused on reigniting growth. Uh, and then we had, you know, focused on their content and their programming around the world. Uh, built an ad product in six months from scratch uh, to out working in the world. Um, and, and the programming starting probably with Stranger Things season four and then rolling into a big global phenomenon like Wednesday uh, and back to back hits from all of our content around the world. Um, it's just been, uh, it was just the windows at our back for sure. What's your top priority right now? Um, reigniting growth of the company. Um, we've got, if you think about, um, there was a lot of discussion about the streaming business in the last six months. People were openly questioning whether or not this is a good business. Well, of course it's a great business because this is what consumers want. Uh, the world is moving to streaming and on demand uh, the, and away from linear television, away from pay television and away from transactional movies. Uh, and the people who do this well, um, which we've been solely focused on for 25 years as a company, uh, are going to be uh, very critical in this space. And in terms of being profitable, um, look at what is success streaming. I really think there are three business metrics, only three. The business can be portrayed very complex or very simple. I think it's quite simple. Number one is engagement. Do people watch? How much do they watch? Where do they watch? And when it comes to engagement, um, you know, we're clearly leading that around the world. Uh, when the second one, which is revenue. Do people pay? Do they think this is worth paying for, this content that we're watching? Uh, and then because that can be reinvested in more content and more programming and creating consumer joy. Uh, and then the third is profit. Is it profitable? And um, among all of our peers, we are profitable. We are, Netflix is a profit, is, is company is profitable globally in our streaming endeavors, which our major competitors are not. So if you look at, um, sub counts and all those kind of things, those are sub metrics. The real metrics of the business are engagement, revenue and profit. Okay, I'm gonna come back to that, but before I have to ask you, um, so speaking of the streaming and, and, and non-profit and profit, I just read a piece in Time Magazine, yeah. which said the streaming wars are now in their chaos era. Okay, and they said, <laughs> it said that any platform that's not named Netflix is losing money. Uh, Disney is laying off thousands of people. Uh, and one of, the, one of the lines in the piece was that the content arms race kicked off by Netflix hasn't paid off. Uh, what's your take? Give us a sense of what's happening. What are these streaming wars? Um, well, it depends on who paid it off for. Uh, yes, we, we, have a, we did definitely ignite what I think is the largest explosion of original production, maybe in the history of the medium. Um, and I think in our, on, from our perspective, um, you have to bring a lot to the table. In the new generation of uh, entertainers, um, people have very diverse taste and they, have, and they expect what they, to get what they want. 
and you don't always feel like the same thing. I always joke about that. Um, my wife and I never agree what to watch, and we love each other enough to be married and live in the same home. Uh, and so people have very different tastes and different moods, and you have to have something for all those moods. So we started investing in a lot of breadth of content early on. Uh, and so we're, for our early investment has paid off. Uh, and for us, the, what, what they talk about being the only company that isn't called Netflix, uh, they're all losing money. Where we're, why we're not, we never took our P&L to zero to grow this business. We grew it soundly uh, by really focusing on consumers and consumer first. And we didn't, uh, so I think as long as you're in the happy consumer business, uh, you can grow infinitely as long as you keep those members happy. Ted, you talked about breadth of content, but you know, when House of Cards first premiered in 2013, uh, you had said that we want to become HBO before HBO can become us. But more recently, you've said that Netflix is going to be part HBO, part FX, part Comedy Central, part the Food Network. Uh, is this a change of tack? No, it's an expansion of it. So yes, we still do that type of programming that we talked about back in the House of Cards days, which believe it or not is, is 10 years ago this month uh, we launched House of Cards. So it, just, it feels like we've been in it for 50 years, but it's 10 years ago this month. And when you think about that and the, then continuing to broaden the offering, we only were doing a handful of kind of prestige dramas in the early days. And today we produce across every genre of television programming, every version of movies, every genre of movies. Um, so when you say that we want to, when I said that about HBO, I was trying to get into the shorthand, which is I think that they were at the time the kind of North Star of high quality programming. And we had not yet made anything. So I said, when we get into this, I want to be that great at making the programming before they get better and better at kind of managing subscription services and streaming. Eventually everyone was gonna do that and we wanted to beat them at the quality before they beat us at streaming. So, and I think we largely have done that and we've moved way beyond wanting to be HBO. Um, but if you look at it and say, why well, I said those, we want to be all those things, M much like India, what is it? I'm gonna say right, uh, Tamal, uh, Tami, Tami, right? Tali. The, the, yes, Tali, Tali, sorry. Right. Uh, where it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. And because I think that is what people want. Right? I think sometimes you want a drama, sometimes you want a comedy, or sometimes with this incredible history uh, and rich history of Indian cinema, sometimes you want it all in the same movie. Uh, and we want to be able to provide that. So. so is it like Bella said, we want to replace all television? Well, we want to be your choice. We want to make your favorite show, your favorite film. Uh, and so right now you do that by navigating through 500 cable, cable channels uh, to land on one. And we're saying is not only can you find that all on Netflix, will help you find the thing that you love. And there's tremendous value in being very good at figuring out consumer taste and helping them navigate through the world of enormous choices. Ted, let's talk about Netflix India. Uh, I know that India has always been a priority market for Netflix. Yes. But the general perception seems to be that it's been a bit of a hit and miss for the service here. Um, and I've asked you about this before, and you had said that, look, this is a trial and error phase. Um, to match audiences with stories is very difficult. Yeah. It's very fluid and we're committed to getting better and better. Yep. Now, in January, Netflix India had Trial by Fire, which is a superb piece of storytelling. Uh, you. Do you think the team is already better and better? I think they're better every day. And I do think from the, you say it's hit and miss. I think when you enter into a new market, sometimes it's miss, 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 hit, 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 hit. And I think that's, you know, like, and, and what I figured out early on when we started launching uh, in various countries is you didn't learn much in one country that was helpful in the next country. You have to be there. You have to be on the ground and you have to understand consumer taste. You have to understand the culture. You have to understand the, his, the industry. You have to understand creators in that country. What are the challenges to getting movies made and series made? And in the case of India, remember, I think India's got this beautiful, rich uh, cinema culture and not that much around television at that time when we first got here. So Sacred Games was our kind of early attempt to say, well, what if you took um, the principles of cinema uh, and infused them into television? And would the, would the Indi Indian audiences love that? And you know that was our first show out of the gate, and now you look going forward, uh, la we're, we've now produced 100 original projects in India. Last year alone, 28. 
Uh, and then to your, what you were saying earlier, just, you know, we're only in February and we've already released um, uh, Trial by Fire, uh, 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 say, The Romantics. The Romantics, I was just going to talk about this great documentary we just did in class. Uh, and so it's been for us, I think that these are, uh, and it's early February, it's only early February, that the slate of films and series that we have coming up for the next year are stronger than we've ever had. So this idea of really getting into the, into the rhythm and the groove of local taste and local desire, I think we're better at that than we ever were. And I do think that why we can get there is our team who runs India, run it from India. Um, a lot of, I think, uh, uh, companies who try to run India out of California <laughs> get frustrated early on because they just don't learn anything. Uh, and here our team really does understand the local culture and the local storytellers, and they themselves are part of the local audience which gives us a large advantage. And that's why we've invested so heavily in our, in, uh, not just in production in India, but we have 250 people in an office in Mumbai. We have an office here in Delhi. Uh, people who really care about, um, you know, making great content in India. Yeah. And of course, last year, the big success stories uh, were Gangubai and RRR for Netflix. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Incredible. I mean, honestly, Ted, I've never seen that much euphoria around an Indian film like there was for RRR? Well, look, I think what's really special about those two movies this year, um, every time, once in a while, there's an inflection point in a change in, in distribution or a change in storytelling or a change in appetite. Um, being in Los Angeles during uh, award season, uh, this year, RRR and uh, Gangabai were in the discussion deeply. Everyone was talking about this. There are 180 movies to watch on the voting site, uh, and two that got watched a lot were these two movies. Most, and then they get found out because they saw them on Netflix. So those movies kind of get pushed into the culture on Netflix, and then people start talking about, hey, did you see this movie? Did you see this movie? And RRR, for many people who I know, may have been the first Indian movie they ever saw. And for them, it was such a wild journey that they want more. They're going to want more. The way that Squid Game did that for Korean content around the world, again, on Netflix. So it's not that you, uh, it's impossible to have a global hit. It's very rare, and you need to have a distribution platform like Netflix, and you need to have a system of choosing like Netflix to help surface things that you may not know you're going to like, but we do. <laughs> and we could put that movie in front of you, and it's, it was an enormous success on Netflix, RRR, and I think it's been, uh, even, you know, the director acknowledged as much when he was nominated for the Oscar, uh, or for the, nom for the Golden Globes, for the, yeah, yeah. Um, that they, most people in the world found it on Netflix. Yeah. But, practically speaking, what do you need to By do? By the way, I should, I include those two, but I forgot. Um, Elephant Whisperer, which is actually nominated for the Absolutely. Academy Award. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, for that's the on Netflix For too. short documentary. And it's our second nomination for short documentary. Both films from India. Uh, period, End of Sentence, which won the Oscar a few years ago. And then Elephant Whispers, which is nominated this year. How wonderful. Yeah. How wonderful. How, what, practically speaking, what's the way to consistently have local content break out globally? Um, make it work locally. There, there is no, you cannot reverse engineer a global show. Uh, the things that work globally are the things that are the most authentic local. Um, uh, Squid Game from Korea was every bit Korean television and, Korean, and a hybrid of Korean television and Korean cinema. Uh, and it worked first and foremost in Korea and then blew up around the world. And I think that's true of, of all of our shows that have worked globally, is that they first and foremost uh, were loved by the local audience. Ted, one of the most mysterious things about the streaming world is, of course, numbers, <laughs> right? Because so little is revealed. Uh, so, you know, there are all these subscription numbers that do the rounds. And if you look at those, then yes, Netflix is lagging. But if you look at um, third party apps, you know, uh, if you look at App Annie or Comscore numbers. In fact, Netflix leads because, like you were saying, engagement is so high. It's 74% right. for Netflix, whereas the rest of the platforms are declining. So, I know you already addressed this in a little bit, but is that then your measure of success? Uh, and how does Netflix India rack up? It's absolutely the measure of success. It has to start with engagement. Do people care enough to spend their viewing time with you? Do they, are, are they spending their screen time with Netflix? And so that's why that engagement metric is so fine. 
is so important. In India, like I said, we've had the best year of our existence in India. Uh, we grew engagement from in India 30%. So our watching our content watching grew by 30% last year in India. Our, our revenue grew by 25% in India. Again, wouldn't have happened if it wasn't tied to that engagement lift. So a lot of um, measurement, you know, if you're trying to steer around subscriber number and, and they make nice headlines, but they're not a real business metric. You know, does that behind that subscriber number, is their engagement, is their revenue, is their profit? With Netflix, yes. You know, uh, traditional wisdom in India is that you can't really build a mass platform without sport. Now, you've said that Netflix is not anti-sport, it's pro-profit, yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, and, and you're confident that you will build, you'll take this to twice its size without sport, but you know, here it's like, if you don't have cricket, you can't do it. So, what's your response? Uh, well, we've built, it has, it has been true historically that sports were very important for pay television, for broadcast television. And I think for the most part, it was a very large loss leader. So the big question was, can you build a big audience or a big business without a lost leader of sports? Um, and for us, we have proven that we can and we have. And uh, so, so I do think that we can. And I do think the way people engage in sports isn't all just about watching the game itself. Um, look at the impact that we've had on Formula One around the world with our show Drive to Survive in which we just launched new shows in, that take place in the world of professional tennis, in the world of professional golf. Um, uh, you saw The Last Dance and the impact that it had on my, both on Michael Jordan and on the NBA around the world. Uh, we saw bigger numbers, uh, viewing numbers on Netflix internationally than ESPN saw domestically on Last Dance. So we do engage sports lovers on Netflix, just not with the live game. Uh, and I don't think, I just think in our subscription model, we don't really have a path to profitability for live sports, but yet. But we do definitely engage in people who, with people who love sports and they see them on Netflix in the, in the form of these great sports documentaries. So tech guru um, Scott Galloway said that Netflix spends more on content than the defense budget of Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is, it's actually more. You spend more than the defense budget of Sweden. It's, <laughs> <laughs> at $17 billion yeah, I was going to say, I don't know the defense budget of Sweden, but I know our content budget, and it is that. You're correct. So, yeah. how much of this, Ted, is for Netflix India? And what is the brief in terms of content? Because as you give cheaper options, as you have an ad-supported tier, you're going to have to sort of make the content more mass rather than premium. Uh, yeah. So, what's the brief? Look, I think the key is that you're going, as you start in the business, you... Whenever we launched anywhere in the world, the first people who signed up for Netflix are, were probably very uh, Western-centric in their taste, uh, early adopters to technology, had wired broadband at home and a big screen TV and all that. And as you get more and more mass, you get more and more uh, mix of folks, so you needed a mix of price points. So over the years, we've added multiple price points, including we're rolling out you know, an, ad an ad tier around the world. Um, and the programming too then begins a little more in the mainstream. You don't abandon the other program, you add, it's additive, this is all additive. And then as people move up and down in, their, in the way that they look at the programming and the taste, sometimes you find yourself watching something that you've never seen before or thought you would like and you love it. We have a, um, an unscripted show from Korea right now called Physical 100 that people are watching all over the world. And this is again, we've only been making original content in Korea for a few years and working across all forms of, of storytelling. The way that Indian Matchmaker is a very big hit in the United States, uh, that you can make all those content work. So when I tell you that we're growing engagement and, uh, and revenue in India, then the, the next part of that is that India gets a little bit bigger piece of the content budget. Uh, and, and so you basically are trying to constantly get just ahead of or just behind the growth in a market and figure out what's working and keep investing. So I would say that we are going to be grow investing more and more in India uh, as we can continue to grow engagement and revenue in India. And would this sort of content brief be, again, be all things to all people? Yeah, definitely. So we want to invest broadly in things that people love. And, so, and again, in the things that you may be in the mood for. So that could be you know, a, a very soapy drama or it could be you know, a big action film or more of a prestige drama. 
Ted, last year when the 1.2 million subscriber loss was reported and the stock price fell, uh, there was, and this was actually reported in many sort of platforms and newspapers, there was sort of a, almost audible glee in Hollywood, right? To see a giant tumble, also because you upended every rule that was and that <laughs> existed till then. At that point, Ted, did you have a sort of a dark night of the soul? Did you, were you afraid and how did you get past it? Um, like I was saying earlier, the company was really built to be resilient. So, uh, and I also, I try to have great perspective. So people say a lot of very nice things about Netflix. You don't take them too seriously because when they say mean things about Netflix, you don't take them too seriously either. Uh, and I wouldn't say that we really stumbled as much as we tripped. Uh, and I do think so it's a matter of you know, gathering your things and getting back to work. And we've done it from the beginning. When we started Netflix, when we were just mailing DVDs around the United States, we were at it, we were leading the market, and then Walmart, the world's biggest retailer, and Blockbuster, at that time, the, lar the world's largest entertainment company, both came at our business and undercut our price dramatically and tried to run at us. And we did, we, we sunk a little bit and we came back. And we came back by making a better product and keeping our members and our customers first and foremost. Didn't worry about the competition very much. Um, and then when we launched into our streaming business, we had a little uh, bouncy middle there. We were trying to figure out between DVD and streaming, which was going to be our future and how we, which date you'd want to pull the plug on one or the other. And we did this thing called Quickster that uh, the members hated everywhere. Uh, and a bunch of people quit and they, you know, and our stock went down then. Actually, our stock dropped much more dramatically than it did recently and came back within about 18 months. So we've been through, you know, um, success stories are very rarely straight up and to the right. Uh, there's a history of downs and lows, and mostly when you get through them, you barely remember them. So in success, uh, you barely remember those moments, but you try to remind yourself all the time because you want to stay sharp and you want to stay, avoid unforced errors and you want to think about um, what, what did we do wrong then and how do we, let's make sure we don't do that again, but let's try something new. And like you said earlier, we, we did break a lot of rules when we got into the business, but I'll let, I'll let you in on a secret. It's not because we were trying to be rebels. We didn't know the rules. <laughs> so it helped us a lot. So you don't panic ever, Ted? Panic? Yeah. Do no. you ever get scared? No, I, I mean, it's, you will always want to be a little scared. You always want a little, um, very, a healthy level of nervousness, uh, but not panic. I think here's what I take a lot of confidence in. We've been, we have, we have been in this business for 25 years. We have one business, this is all we do, so we have to be great at it. We've built a phenomenal team. Reed Hastings had created a company within a phenomenal culture uh, that's resilient and fast moving. Uh, rapid deployment, rapid recovery is kind of a, a model that we've worked on from the beginning. And, um, and, and we're in a business that people want. Um, streaming is the future. Um, People are going to increasingly move away from linear television, away from transactional movies, towards streaming. In fact, in the US, where we're very penetrated and streaming is quite mature, um, streaming grew 46% in December. And, and by next year, it's forecast to surpass both cable and broadcast to be the dominant way people watch television in the United States. And I believe that's gonna be true around the world. Uh, I read an article, Ted, in the New York Times in which Barry Diller said this about you, and I quote exactly, he's had more singular influence on movies and television shows than anyone ever had. He has denuded the power of the old movie companies that had held for almost a hundred years. They're now irrelevant to setting the play and rules of the day. If there is still a Hollywood, he is it. <laughs> Are you Hollywood, Ted? <laughs> That would be news to my wife and kids. Uh, that, um, I, look, I think that the, the version of Hollywood uh, that Barry talks about, Barry is very generous, by the way, when he says that. I think the reason why it's possible that um, I've had that kind of influence is because Netflix has had that kind of influence and that streaming is such a popular way of consuming. So in that way, very few places and few companies have 
done movies and television uh, together in the same place under the same scale at the scale that we do and in as many countries as we do and as many languages as we do uh, and it really has changed the way people watch I mean in back to sorry to keep quoting the US but uh, in the US which has no appetite for international programming over the years uh, our watching of non-english content keeps doubling every year so this is, I think, a way to kind of make content, make movies and shows anywhere in the world. And if you make them good enough, they'll be watched all over the world. That's never been done before. And I just happen to be the guy who's, you know, overseeing a lot of very smart people doing it. Mm. What are you proudest of, Ted, of what Netflix India has achieved? And what do you want to see happen in the next two years? Uh, proudest of, of Netflix India has been that ability to just keep going. You know, uh, yes, we started out pretty slow. We were trying to figure, had a lot to figure out. Uh, but just the ability to keep going and making great programming. Um, if you want to see, we just released this, we, you mentioned the doc, Romantics. I, for me, the, I want to make this mandatory viewing in the company where I want every one of our employees, all 10,000 people to watch all episodes of this documentary to learn about this incredible, rich history of cinema in India. Um, the storytelling is great. It tells you so much about the culture here and the business culture and the storytelling culture. Um, I learned more in that four hours than I have learned in the last 20 years trying to figure out India uh, for, for movies and television shows. And I'm super proud of the fact that we're in the discussion um, um, uh, when we talk about Indian cinema, which is you know something to be so proud of. Um, and I think even this year, like I said, with Oscar nominees from India, uh, and are being able to drive audiences to films that they've never seen before from place, new places in the world. That's a lot to be proud of. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to end, Ted, with a few questions from the Proust questionnaire. Um, what is your idea of perfect happiness? Perfect happiness. Uh, it's a, in, the, in life or? Uh, in life. <laughs> You know what, I think that I am, I, I think I have a, ver a version of it, uh, which is people are always constantly trying to figure out what the life work balance is. And I have figured out that there is no life work balance. So do something you love. And I do that. I get to do the thing I love. Which living person do you most admire? If it's very, um, that's a long list. It's very hard not to, um, to look at the resilience of um, not just uh, President Zelensky, but the people of the Ukraine and, and the, what they've been through and the, res and the strong resilience of those people. It's amazing. On what occasion do you lie, Ted? I'm sorry? On what occasion do you lie? Oh, hardly ever. It's, it, the problem is I can't remember things very well, so if you lie, you have to have a very good memory to lie. So. <laughs> <laughs> Last one, what is your motto? My motto is, is <laughs> this is a business motto, I ask the teams all the time, is the juice worth the squeeze? So is this going to be so big that you'd be willing to put up with almost anything to make it work? Uh, so when someone wants to do something that's really hard or really controversial or really difficult, I say, is the juice worth the squeeze? <laughs> nice. Ted, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.